My name's Andrew Heap. I'm Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. It's my great pleasure to introduce this distinguished Geoscience Australia lecturer seminar today by Dr. Catherine Waltenberg. Catherine's presentation today will focus on her amazing work in developing an isotopic atlas of Australia. And uh, she will tell us about how it can be a window into the geological evolution of the Australian continent. But before uh, Catherine starts and I hand over to her, a little bit about Catherine. As a student at the University of Queensland, Catherine was attracted to geology because of the combination of field and laboratory work it offered. She completed her BSc honours in 2006 and her PhD thesis in 2012. She then joined Geoscience Australia uh, the following year as a graduate geoscientist. Her work specialises in geochronology, particularly absolute dating of by measuring the radioactive decay of isotopes, by which the ages of geological events as varied as volcanic eruptions, the deposition of major ore bodies, and even the formation of our solar system can be determined. During her PhD, Catherine worked with Caltech to develop a mass spectrometer to age the rocks on Mars as part of the Mars rover project and undertook testing for the equipment. And Catherine is currently the activity leader of the age and isotopic mapping in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division of Geoscience Australia. So please welcome Catherine and I now hand over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Let me just get the presentation up on the screen. Uh, you should be able to see that now. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I am talking about the isotopic atlas today. Um, and I, before I start, I just want to uh, mention that this work is, is not just my work, it's the work of a, a huge team of people, uh, including the scientists, um, as well as many, many people and teams that supported the science, um, such as database um, developers and people who got the work online. And I want to acknowledge that I'm giving this presentation on behalf of them as well. So kind of as a starting at the end of my talk, I just want to tell what uh, we've done with the Isotopic Atlas of Australia. We have uh, five new maps to understand Australia's geological history based on the uh, isotope data. This is, I think, the largest compilation of isotopic data compiled across the Australian continent. Uh, the, so the first time all of this data has been put together at this scale. Um, but First, um, I'll give you a bit of context uh, of, of, of what the isotopic atlas is and what it means. So starting at the very beginning, or starting right now, uh, we all live on the Earth and we rely on it for our survival. It, in this way, we're all connected to this planet, whether we're um, completely aware of it or not. Um, but it's important to realise that the planet is uh, actively active and changing through time. Uh, we can see it in the passing of the seasons, but it's also changing on a much uh, longer scale. And that's over the four, about four and a half billion year history. Uh, and to understand our planet as it exists now, we also must understand the history. Uh, and there are lots of ways to do this depending on, on what we're trying to understand. Uh, before I get stuck in, I do want to say that this is one story about the history of Australia and there are many others out there. Uh, and I particularly want to mention, as acknowledged by Geoscience Australia upon entry to our building in Canberra and also in our Strategy 2028 document, um, I would also like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia as the custodians on the land which we're studying and in particular celebrate the contribution and understanding of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as Australia's original mappers, miners, navigators and historians. So how can we look back through time? Uh, and the answer to this question really depends on how far back you want to look through time. So starting with a very modern example, uh, water is critical for survival and understanding it is particularly important in Australia. And this, um, there's a relatively modern way of looking at how surface water changes over time and that's using uh, more than 40 years of satellite data. So this image here that you can see 
shows the Menindee Lakes, which are in far west New South Wales. And among other things, these lakes supply um, water to the city of Broken Hill, as well as being an important water source for uh, inland wildlife and agriculture. And on this map, uh, you can see the lakes as, as various colours. The colours represent how regularly water is in these lakes. So blue means the lakes usually have water, red means more often dry. And, and so this information that we've collected from observations back through time helps um, with water planning and, and um, understanding water, water management. Uh, going, stepping further back, um, we have records from the past couple hundred of year, hundreds of years for earthquakes that have happened in Australia. Um, these earthquakes are detected and recorded on seismometer equipment um, and complemented with written records and photographs. Uh, and this information helps us understand places that might be at higher risk from earthquake damage and so we can plan accordingly. Uh, stepping back even further, the first people of Australia have a strong connection to country and they're experts in navigation and management of natural resources. Uh, a major reason for this is through the transmission of knowledge um, through oral traditions. This means that there is a knowledge system about the history of Australia that predates and complements Western science. Uh, one example of this that you can um, shown on this slide is the record of coastal inundation or sea level rise, which is preserved in oral histories and has been verified empirically by Western science. So the map that you can see is from a paper by Nunn and Reed, which shows the location of Aboriginal groups interviewed by the researchers. These researchers calculated that the 21 unconnected Aboriginal stories about coastal inundation have endured as long as 13,000 years, which is a testament to the strength of these oral traditions. The researchers proposed that these stories um, and others may be some of the world's earliest human memories. But if there are no people around to observe events, we can also look at the rocks themselves. Um, and as an example, fossils can hold clues about how old the rocks are. So um, I've got a few images of fossils here. I, most of us might be familiar with the trilobite or the ammonite fossils. Um, there's also um, smaller microscopic fossils um, that also exist that people use to, to understand the history. So for example, if you've got a trilobite in your rock, um, using the time scale that you can see in the center of the uh, slide, you could show that the rock is Cambrian to Permian in age. Uh, but how, how do we know exactly how old these fossils are? And this is where I get to isotopes. So the earth is, as I mentioned, extremely old four and a half billion years, which is, um, I think, for most people kind of beyond comprehension. And for a lot of this deep time, isotopes are really the only way to quantify m most of it. Um, there are different isotopes that you use to understand different lengths of time and different parts of the history. Some of them are relatively short lived and they um, uh, are used to to understand events closer to now. And the, an example would be carbon dating. Others are much longer lived and you can use these to understand uh, the complete history of the earth, more or less. Um, and as an example, uh, the, the rock that I've just put up on the slide there is um, contains the oldest earth material, which in uh, zircons, which have been dated by the uranium lead geochronology isotope method. Um, it, and this rock is in Jack Hills, it's from Western Australia, and it contains the oldest earth material. And just to kind of uh, reinforce that point, it's, it's almost 4.4 billion years old. And, and the number there, you know, all the zeros just kind of show how how old these things are that we're talking about. So we make lots of maps of the planet 
uh, one example in the top right is the surface geology map for Australia. We also make maps of the subsurface uh, and this uh, image that's taking up most of this slide here is the upcoming absolutely stunning gravity map of Australia. Um, just to get your eye in, you can see the outline of Australia as a thin black line uh, and uh, the map covers the entire continent and then also offshore into the ocean. So uh, this map is made when slight variations in gravity, um, which, which happen because different rocks have different densities. Um, we can measure these dif differences and, and, and use it to look at how these different rocks are distributed underground. So as I said, this is a new map which will be publicly released very soon. And I also want to mention that there will be another seminar coming up and which um, we'll cover it. So keep an eye out for that one if you're interested in hearing more about that. But my point here is that the earth hasn't always looked this way, either in the surface or the subsurface. And isotopes can tell us about not, not just the, the surface, how, how the surface used to be, but also uh, how the deep earth um, used to be configured. Uh, and and that, this, that's um, what I'm saying here. So, so on the right, that image is a, an interpretation of how all the pieces of the alien continent as we know it today might have um, been configured uh, about 1800 million years ago. Uh, so it's, if you know what you're looking at, it's, it's kind of recognizable, but uh, it looks very, very different to now. And so we can use isotopes uh, because they preserve the information about how um, things used to be, including subsurface information. Um, I guess in a similar way to fossils where you don't get the entire picture, you just get a little um, tantalizing snapshot of, of what used to be there, but it's enough to give you hints about the past and, and to start building that understanding um, about, about the past. Um, what are isotopes? I'll cover this quite quickly uh, from, I guess, high school chemistry. Uh, an isotope is when you have the same element, uh, which, is, which is determined by how many protons in an atom it has, but you have a different number of neutrons. And so here I've got three isotopes of, of hydrogen. And so hydrogen with no uh, neutrons is, is well, it's just hydrogen, I call it, but it's also known as protium, it turns out. Um, if you put a neutron in the nucleus, you get deuterium, which is, um, has, has, is, is mostly similar, but one important thing is that it's actually twice as heavy because it has twice as many atoms in the nucleus. And then if you add three, you get tritium. Uh, but to, how do you use atoms and isotopes to understand geology? Uh, there's really two basic principles. And if you understand these two things, you, I'd say you understand most of what you need to know to understand ge isotope geochronology and geochemistry. So I will revisit these two concepts um, throughout the talk. So I want to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. And the first thing, part is fractionation between reservoirs. So to start with an example that people might be more familiar with, the water cycle. Um, as we know, you know, uh, water in the ocean evaporates, um, travels over land perhaps, rains down, um, flows into rivers and streams or underground, makes its way back out to the ocean or evaporates again. And as part of this cycle, that causes changes uh, in the oxygen isotopes. So oxygen has two stable isotopes, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Now, because it's such a light element, um, there's a quite a significant difference in the mass of these two isotopes. And what that means is oxygen 16, which has two less neutrons, is lighter and evaporates more easily into the atmosphere. And in contrast, the oxygen 18 is left behind. So during the process of evaporation, for example, you, you're changing the uh, distribution of these isotopes throughout the different parts of the cycle. Um, so that's kind of a basic concept of, of how cycling through reservoirs can change isotopes. Um, 
I will say also that water is also present in deep reservoirs, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. So if there is water in the mantle and it has a very different isotope signature to oxygen that's been through this water cycle and, and has, has had its isotopes um, differently affected by the different processes. So the water cycle is just one part of a more comprehensive system of, of the earth. Um, and the basic idea I want to get across is that the, the chemistry or the elements in the different layers of the earth, um, they're all different. And, and, and these differences lead to isotopic differences, which we can then um, use and measure and understand the earth with. So I think, um, what am I trying to say here? So as a kind of obvious example, you know, the, the core of the earth is composed of something quite different to the atmosphere. Um, <laughs> you can't really breathe the core of the earth, for example. Um, and, but, but there's other differences as well between the inner core, outer core, the mantle, um, upper and lower mantle and the crust. Um, and, and in each of these layers, there are different differences in the elements in each, which um, then over time leads to isotope differences as well. And um, so this concept is, is key, I think, to understanding isotope geochemistry. And I'll, as I said, I'll revisit this a little later. So going from the huge planet scale down to microscopic scale, the last kind of reservoir I want to talk about is, is mineral reservoirs. So as well as different elements ending up in different parts of the planet, um, when you crystallize a rock and form minerals, different elements end up in, as different minerals within a rock. So for example, this granite I've got here, it's composed of various uh, different minerals, some of them which are pictured here, quartz, feldspars, biotite and, and zircon in a small amount, not usually coming out of the rock as a cut gemstone, but um, you get the idea. And, and these different minerals have different uses uh, for different isotope studies. So depending on what you want to understand, you might look at one or a different one of these minerals as, as your um, system of choice. So that was about, that was about fractionation. Now I'm going to talk about the other uh, important thing to understand uh, radiogenic isotopes, and that is radioactive decay over time. So most of us are at least familiar with the basics, but just to um, revisit. Um, so if you have an isotope that's radioactive, over time it decays to form a daughter isotope. So for example, some isotopes of uranium decay over time to lead. So the uranium is called the parent and the lead is the daughter. And you can see the, um, the chart on the left. Um, you start at, at time zero with everything being parent and then over one half-life, uh, half of that parent isotope will have turned into the daughter isotope. And over two half-lives, um, half again will have turned into the daughter isotope. And, and that's kind of pictured here as well um, underneath with the little um, balls. And, and there's a chart there as well, which um, illustrates kind of as you go through the different half-lives, the ratio of the daughter to the parent changes. So at the start, there's no daughter. Um, later on, there's one-to-one -one or 50-50 of each. And then you get three times more daughter to parent and so on and so on. And um, that, that's the concept that we're using. So if we can measure the daughter and the parent isotopes uh, and we know how long a half-life is, then we can calculate back and figure out how long it's taken to, to form those daughter isotopes from the parent ones. And just as a, an example of two of the, the main systems we use, particularly for extremely old um, rocks, uh, as I mentioned, uranium lead um, 
this is one of the isotopes of uranium that decays into one of the isotopes of lead and the potassium argon system or argon argon uses potassium 40 decaying into argon 40 and and all um, isotope geochronology methods will have this parent daughter relationship so in a general sense um, I'll just give you a bit of idea of how geochronology actually works. And during putting this talk together, um, someone asked me, what is geochronology? And I realized that I had a slightly um, skewed idea of what it was because of my background in isotope geochronology. So I just wanted to acknowledge that when, I, when I'm talking about geochronology here, I'm talking about radiogenic isotope geochronology. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that there are many, many other um, forms of geochronology, some of which I mentioned in the introduction, but there are others as well that, that are also valid. So um, just to continue, um, the basic idea is that um, a mineral or crystal crystallizes, uh, which traps the parent isotope and hopefully excludes the daughter isotope. And then you start the clock and the, the parent isotope starts decaying over time. And then now we, we collect that rock or mineral from the environment, we take it back to the lab and we measure, we count the amount of the parent and the daughter isotope and figure out how long has passed. So uh, what do you need to be able to date uh, rocks in particular? Uh, you need to have, so a chronometer is an isotope system and a mineral. And um, I've talked about a couple of isotope systems, uranium, lead or argon. And then you need a mineral that you're going to, to analyze. And um, the rest of this list are th are about how, how to decide on this. So the first thing is this mineral petrogenesis idea. Basically what it means is you need to look at the rock and understand what formed when um, and how it relates to everything else in the rock. Because um, rocks tend to be quite complex. If you don't know exactly what you're dating and how it relates to things, you might get an age, but misinterpret it. So the picture in the top right is showing uh, monazite, which is a uranium lead uh, mineral that you can use for dating. And it's intergrown with um, a type of sulfide, which is something that forms uh, when ore deposits form. So, and it's intergrown, the two are intergrown together. So if you date them monazite, you're getting an age for the mineralization. But if you didn't see that relationship, you, it might not be clear what exactly your, your age relates to. So you also need the mineral that you choose. It needs to have enough of the parent isotope. Um, that's so that you can measure it, so that you can measure the parent isotope uh, in significant amounts, but also so that you get enough of the daughter isotope accumulating to also measure that. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get much of anything happening. Um, ideally, you also have the mineral which has almost no of the none of the daughter isotope to start with in its structure. Because if you imagine this hourglass analogy, if you start with sand um, in, already in the bottom of the hourglass, how do you know how much of that was already there versus how much has fallen from the top? Uh, you also need the hourglass to be um, resistant to um, gain or loss. So what that means is if, if you have isotopes that instead of flowing from the top to the bottom uh, are actually leaving through a crack in the, in the hourglass or whatever, then you're not actually capturing the full story and, and you won't get a good age. And the other thing is that you need to have um, the decay rate, the half-life, um, being at a certain rate that that corresponds to the time that you're interested in. And uh, I think, I, yes, I put this picture back here just to illustrate, you know, towards the end, after you get four or more half-lives have passed, you get very little difference from half-life to half-life in the difference between the daughter or the parent isotopes. So it gets harder and harder to measure the longer you leave it. And and so you need to tune choose your isotope system to have a, um, half-life that suits the process that you're interested in. So applications of isotope geochronology. Um, this is 
the picture on the right is the rock cycle um, and you can follow along with that. Um, you can date processes corresponding to almost the entire rock cycle, um, starting with magma as it comes out of the earth um, and cools, cools it near the surface perhaps and forms an igneous or volcanic rock. Um, as it cools, it crystallizes and you can date the crystals in that and get an age uh, from that. Then if, if that rock gradually weathers and erodes and turns into sediment and then gets buried and cemented and turns into a sedimentary rock, you can also understand about how that the, um, the time in the timing of that sedimentary rock. Um, this is a little different because it's, it's actually quite difficult to date the actual time that a rock became a sedimentary rock. Um, and often what we're doing is, is measuring the age of the components within the rock. So the zircons that originally formed in the igneous rock and then, and then were transported. So you may, may not be actually directed, directly dating the sedimentary rock more constraining the age because um, you know it can't be older than the age of the rock it came from uh, because you need something to be able to turn it into sediments and then if you bury a rock at heat and pressure you can um, dissolve recrystallize minerals and, and in that process that's what you're measuring as well you can you can date these kinds of um, processes same with uh, fluid alteration. So if you've got a, a hot liquid going through a rock that may be um, other, that maybe dissolves or recrystallizes um, minerals because of that, then you can date those processes if you're forming new minerals in that process. And also um, as, as rocks, as, as the, the, what am I trying to say? As, the surface gradually erodes up here, you might be exposing new rocks to the surface. And uh, depending on what geochronometer you're using, you can also use that to track um, how long ago, for example, a mountain was uplifted and became the mountain range. I, I have an example here for you. It's about um, mineral deposits in the Tennant Creek region. So there's a location map in the top top right. Um, so the Tennant Creek region is in the middle of the Northern Territory. Um, and you can see some roads on the, on the map to kind of place you in Tennant Creek at the top left. So the Tennant Creek area um, around the, the map is a geological map. It shows the different rock units around here. And there's also circles which show where uh, mineral deposits are. So what we're trying to understand here is when did this mineralization occur? And the idea then is to try and understand, well, where should we look next? Where also has the same ingredients that we need to make these mineral deposits? So it turns out that some of these rocks have muscovite in them, which is a mineral you can date with argon, argon geochronology. Uh, there are several ways that the muscovite appears in the rock. So the, the photos on the left show some of their ways. The top left one is uh, foliated muscovite. So you can see it's got the, um, it's, it's aligned with the fabric. So that means that it, it was formed, probably formed during deformation or metamorphism. So if you date that, you get information about that. Um, there's other stuff that's, not doesn't look like that. So if you date that, it would it would be potentially dating something different. Uh, but then the, the bottom one, uh, bottom right left, sorry, um, this muscovite. So the the I guess more grey minerals are the muscovite in this image, at this microscopic image, and then the little slivers of more I guess silvery grey uh, is a mineral called bismuthonite and again because it's intergrown with this 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 mineral bismuthonite is a kind of an ore mineral uh, it if you date this muscovite you'll learn about the mineralization and that's what people did um, this is from a uh, thesis from 1994 and they 
that if they, by dating this Muscovite, they found that the mineralization was happened around 1850, 8, 1850 million years ago. Uh, and this, this figure is a stratigraphic um, column for the rocks in that area. So um, we start to understand where, where the mineralization occurred relative to all the other rocks and when they formed or deposited in the area. So that's good. We understand more about mineralization in the mineral deposits that we know about. But what we want to do is we want to find new mineral deposits. And so this, what we're doing here is we're stepping away from Tennant Creek. So the area that I showed on the map previously is covered by, um, the, is, is in the bottom left of this map. And, and it kind of shows, this map also shows the uh, geology that we can see at the surface is in the colours and then the greys are uh, sediments or, or covered, um, what we call cover units um, that kind of hide what's going on under, under the surface. So people have drilled holes in this area uh, previously and we were able to um, take samples from these drill holes and, and try to start figuring out whether the same ingredients that we have in those Tennant Creek e examples also occur out to the west. So this next slide is again, shows the stratigraphy of this area. So the ages on the vertical axis and the image, the first third of this panel on the left shows the exposed geology around the Tennant Creek area. So the big yellow star is where I put the mineralization age that we discussed earlier. And then these other colors are the geological rock units, um, various sedimentary rocks and um, igneous rocks. And all the little symbols that you can see are different ages that have been used to figure out how old all these rocks are. So they've dated um, sedimentary rocks, volcanic rocks, uh, granites and that kind of thing to, to get a really thorough understanding of, of what the geology is and how it relates to the, the mineralization. And then in the center panel um, with the red square is um, the new information we have for the area to the west undercover. And it's, it's based on like these new ages, which again, you can see with the symbols showing the age and then the um, plus or minus on those, um, how certain we are about those ages. And we're starting to see that there's the same kind of geology out, out I keep saying west, didn't I? Anyway, east, <laughs> it's on the slide, um, out east as there is in the exposed area. So that gives us a really, um, good indication that we're on the right track to possibly being able to find more mineral deposits in in the east. Um, and so that star there with the question mark is, well, is it there? Um, and that's the next question for people to try to understand. So, well, I was going to say an added complication. It's not really, it's just more information. Um, we've revisited the area the Tennant Creek area and, and looked more closely and um, found other mineralization intergrown with, with minerals that we can date and, and, and done some more geochronology uh, and found that there's actually another uh, event, more recent mineralizing event uh, in Tennant Creek. So that means that, you know, it changes the focus. It also increases the amount of area that might have mineral deposits in it, which is um, a really important result. So, I guess part of what I'm trying to say is that when you are using geochronology, uh, it's best to use a workflow that looks kind of like this. So you start off, you, you put together all the information you currently know about the geology in the area, and you come up with some questions or some things you don't understand but would like to, and then you figure out what samples and methods would be the best to understand more about what you're looking at, and then you get your age. And then you feed that back into your geological understanding, you probably come up with more questions and you repeat the process um, as, as much as you need to. Um, and, and you might modify the samples or techniques based on the, on the exact questions that you're trying to solve. 
so that was geochronology. It was very focused on on what is the age of what are the ages of, of rocks and, and processes. Isotope geochemistry. So this is something that most people are probably quite a bit less familiar with. Um, basically what we're doing is applying these isotopes, the same kinds of isotopes, to understanding how the different chemical reservoirs developed and changed and how they've interacted with each other through time. Um, so for example, we're learning using these isotopes about formation of the crust and addition of material from the mantle to the crust and the origin of fluids that might generate ore deposits. Yes, and that picture. So how do we track these reservoirs and what they're doing? Uh, first of all, because um, we're talking about radiogenic isotopes, generally we need some time component for these chemical differences to start resulting in isotopic differences. And secondly, we need samples from uh, as many of the different reservoirs as possible to start measuring these differences and understanding them. So we can't actually uh, physically get to the mantle, but luckily we have uh, rocks like um, igneous rocks that come from uh, the deep earth uh, and possibly the mantle. So, and these can be things that we can actually um, walk across and pick up and sample when they're at or near the surface. Uh, and using these, we can um, estimate the age of the deep crust and, and when uh, new material from the mantle to the crust appeared. Um, and that's what this picture is. So it's, it's talking about, you know, the different ways that um, igneous rocks, granites, um, volcanic rocks, that kind of thing, um, they might come from the mantle, sit at the lower crust and then melt again and, and end up in a sedimentary rock, melting the sedimentary rock and forming a granite pluton inside them. And there's all these different paths that they can take. And each of these paths have different isotopic signatures that we can start to um, disentangle the processes that form these rocks and understand these deep reservoirs. And importantly, um, why, why do we care? Well, when we're adding material from the mantle into the crust, we're also bringing heat, fluids and metals, all of which are needed for mineralization. Uh, here's an example um, to do with nickel mineralization. So there are nickel deposits. This is, before I get too wrapped up, this is southwestern Western Australia. You can see the continental, um, the edge of the continent drawn in this light blue color to try and get your eye in. Um, and there are, in this area, which is called the Yogan Craton, there are nickel deposits. Uh, um, and that they, they're, they're um, shown by the triangles in this map. So the darker and larger triangles have more nickel in them and the smaller ones have less nickel. Um, these nickel deposits are hosted in rocks that come from the mantle, but known as kamatiites. And this map, um, shows kind of the age of the lower crust from the samarium neodymium isotope analyses that were done on um, granites all across this area. And those analysis um, areas, those locations of samples are all the plus symbols on this map. Um, so yeah, so the map is color coded by kind of estimates of crustal age. So the oldest, um, model ages are the, in the, the hot colours, the reds in the white colours, um, going to yellow and then the greens are the youngest, youngest crust as shown in these isotopes. And if you look at where the gradients in the isotope map are, you can see that the nickel deposits more or less sit along um, the place where the isotopic boundary changes um, between younger and, and older. So uh, by looking at these isotope systems and, and mapping them, we can start to, we can add more information of, of why de deposits develop, where and when they do. And also we can use it to predict the location of um, undiscovered deposits in the future. So what? Well, if you've been paying attention, I think you're kind of getting the idea. 
but this is also just to give you a little bit of a mental, take a mental breath. Um, but the next slide, I think, uh, sums up a lot of what I've been talking about so far and the importance of it. So how can you apply isotopes to understand mineral deposits and where they form? You can take a very empirical approach, a very quantitative or numerical approach. You can determine the age of known deposits and then you can use that those ages to look for similar age rocks, that kind of thing. So um, that's very empirical, but there's also a, a role for isotopes in more conceptual work for understanding the favourable tectonic ingredients that go into making a mineral deposit. Um, we can use them to reconstruct past tectonic history and, and again, to predict favourable times and places for undiscovered deposits. So um, to kind of illustrate that, the picture on the left is a very conceptual model of uh, several different types of mineralization, and they, they tend to occur. There's a lot of different ways that mineral deposits form, but in general, we have pretty good models and explanations of, of, of how they form and where and why. And so if we can understand not just how Australia looks now, but how it looked millions of years ago, we can kind of start to understand where we are in this in this map, what sort of mineralization we might be able to expect. So it's taking it back to this kind of, um, you know, older view of, of what Australia looked like to try to understand where mineral deposits might be um, now. So we've been doing a lot of work putting together national data sets and maps uh, to kind of go into a little bit more of, of why we're doing that. We're trying to help people, basically we're trying to make it more efficient for people to access this isotope data. Um, I've, I've, I've got there talking about breaking the cycle of single use science um, and, and, and being able to incorporate existing data into new with, with new exciting results as well and to increase the value of both um, to minimize time and effort on comp compiling and recompiling so you can focus more on interpreting and understanding new data with the context and and just in general maps are more digestible for people who aren't experts in the field um, and as an example I can talk about geophysics so here again is this beautiful um, gravity image comprehensive coverage across Australia there's always new data going into these data sets, but these, these images don't just appear. The, this picture that you see is actually hundreds of individual surveys um, patched together. So it looks less like a patchwork quilt and more like a consistent um, image of, of the entire area. It's a lot of work and it's ongoing, um, but it gives a really, really nice view of, of the complete picture. And that's what we're trying to get to with the isotopes. So, um, here are two of the compilations. I'll talk you through it. Um, these are the geochronology compilations. The dots on these images are the individual sample locations where all the ages were actually collected. And then the background colors are a product of those um, samples and how they look like when you extrapolate it out. So the colors of the samples go from young in the reds to old in the blues. And it's kind of the inverse for the um, background coloring where the youngest are in green and the oldest are in red. And similarly for, for um, both the uranium lead on the left and the argon on the right. Um, looking a bit closer at uranium lead, um, this is all the sample information we have. We've, we've collected it for igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, um, sedimentary rocks. This is two and a half um, thousand analyses ages for the uh, magmatic coverage. You can download this a re report, report that covers all this um, through that link, but it's also available online, as I'll mention in a minute. Similarly with um, argon, argon and potassium argon, this is a different method to uranium lead, but it's complementary. It tells us more about cooling and deformation and exhumation. Um, and something that you can see on both of those maps, 
um, is that there's clear geological patterns. So uh, the colour scale and the background most clearly shows that oldest parts of Australia are in the west, youngest in the east. Uh, on top of there, there's black lines, which are major crustal boundaries, um, kind of which have been developed based on a range of um, different methods. And you can see sometimes that there are uh, patterns with where the ages occur relative to these crustal boundaries. This one's not as complete as the uranium lead. We've spent a lot of effort this year on cleaning up, um, understanding the data, making sure that the ages are classified consistently and adding sample information. So, so um, the published data is, is just for Northern Australia for now, but it'd be great to get the whole, whole continent there. Then we've got isotope geochemistry compilations. So I'm gonna go through these in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides, cause they're a little bit more complicated to understand, but we've got these three data sets um, for samarium, neodymium, lutetium, hafnium and lead lead. And they're telling us, as I mentioned about um, kind of the sources of, of these rocks and what it means. So the neodymium is the most complete. Uh, Dave Champion has been working on this since, at, well, for a long time, but first published the first version of this in 2013. Um, it's since been improved on, um, added more data added. Um, and you see a similar thing with here, this, the lo sample locations are in black and the ages go from old in the warm colors to younger in the, the, the greens. Uh, and it's a similar pattern, but slightly different. And I'll talk about that a bit more. Similarly, Lutetium hafnium, at the moment, it's just the Northern Territory, um, but hoping to expand it. And lead lead isotopes on ore minerals, telling us about the sources of fluids that go into these ores um, and telling us about how mineralization um, is happening. So to illustrate the samarium neodymium isotopes, this image shows, based on the isotopes, how the continent kind of built up through time. So we're starting with the old, which is shown in the bottom left. And as we go through time, as we add newer and newer material, you can see the parts of the continent that start to appear and then um, join together until finally you get um, the youngest parts of the continent forming in the east. So then you can add, again, the major crustal boundaries and the locations of major mineral deposits, and you can start pulling out um, correlations and, and, and more understanding of, of um, what it tells us about, about mineralization in particular. And lead isotopes, I haven't talked about these too much, but the lead compilation is about ore related minerals, as I said, um, so it tells us about this the source of, of fluids and that kind of thing. And the idea is that different areas in the crust have different chemical compositions, including uranium, and that over time leads to differences in lead isotopes. So rocks from different places have different isotope signatures, and these rocks are telling us about the different sources of fluids. Um, in, this, in this map, um, high mu, which means more radiogenic, um, which I think of as more uranium, is, is in the warmer colours and low mu, less radiogenic in the cool colours. And that again has been published in a report, but it's also available online. Um, this is where things are available online through the Exploring for the Future portal. The URL is in the top left there, portal.ga.gov.au. Um, and we've loaded all the individual sample analyses and ages into the portal so people can download these complete data sets and do their own interpretations and uh, whatever they like with them. So we've got, with each point, you can get a lot of information. You can get a lot of sample information. So the rock um, type, the stratigraphic unit, if it has one, um, where it's from, the location, so on. You get the isotope data. Um, in the case of the neodymium, it's and and the hafnium and the lead, it's it's ra isotope ratios, model ages, that kind of thing. With the geochronology, uh, it's more just um, the summary ages. It doesn't have the full um, isotope data in there, but it's still 
um, a very valuable resource. And because it, all this data comes from different places, we have made sure that we have the references, the citations for all this data so that you can go back to the original source and read more about it for get, to get more context. And also so that all these people who have produced all this data get the uh, recognition that they deserve. And where possible, we've also included a URL or a link to where you can actually get the, the document or, or the product that has these reports. And in particular, um, I've tried to um, populate as much URLs for, for GA reports and also geological survey reports to make them a, lot, a bit more accessible um, because a lot of them have now been digitized or available online. Hmm. So wrapping up now, just a few final thoughts. Uh, where we are now, we do have a strong foundation. We have a database and a delivery mechanism and a lot of isotope data to deliver through them. Um, we're still planning for what we're going to do next, but in general, we're, what we're looking to do is expand coverages for some isotope systems. Um, uh, we know that there's data missing in some of these and we're looking to, to complete or at least get towards completion of them. Uh, we'll be using it to guide future analytical programs, looking for gaps in our coverages or where um, new data would have the most impact on our understanding and, and that these compilations will be very useful for that. And we'll be combining, collaborating and integrating with other data sets and knowledge. And here's an example. Um, we've got the magmatic ages in the spots and then the underlying map is a model for lithospheric thickness. Um, and we're starting to compare like how does the thickness of the lithosphere relate to age? What does it tell us about each of those um, data sets and, and what do we um, learn from looking at them both together. Um, I've gone on slightly too long, but um, just to wrap up, I do wanna say a huge thank you to all the isotope geochemists and geochronologists and everyone who supports them um, because without you, um, the isotope atlas wouldn't exist. So uh, thank you very much.